Comme certains d'entre vous le savent, d'origine allemande, elle a donc connu la guerre depuis The Other Side. Elle vit aux États-Unis euh, et a adopté et a été adoptée euh, par les États-Unis, donc a adopté le langage, euh, la langue américaine pour écrire. Elle écrit en américain et non pas en allemand, alors que l'allemand est sa langue euh, première. Et ça crée des situations de, ça crée des situations de décalage. Euh, dans son écriture, euh, des situations peut-être de décalage tout à fait euh, autres, euh, des situations aussi de, de remise en cause de la maîtrise des langues. On dit souvent qu'un poète habite la langue, qu'un poète habite la langue. Euh, Rosemary Waldrop reprend la formule du poète français Valéry, euh, selon laquelle il faudrait se perdre dans la forêt des mots. Et considérant la, la double origine de Rosemary Waldrop, on pourrait se demander euh, ce que, dans son cas, euh, habiter la langue peut bien vouloir dire. Euh, habiter la langue pour un poète dont, justement, la langue n'est pas l'anglais. Euh, donc, quelle position a-t-elle dans cette langue anglaise Est-ce qu'elle a une position tout court euh, euh, Est-ce que sa langue n'est pas une langue sans demeure pour reprendre le, le titre d'un article, d'un livre de, de, de Michel Crépon, euh, et est-ce que sa langue, ce n'est pas finalement la défamiliarisation euh, complète d'elle-même, de la langue elle-même, du l'anglais, euh, euh, par la poésie On pourrait dire euh, en quelque sorte que euh, le travail de Rosemary Waldrop euh, euh, tente à hésiter, euh, à hésiter entre, entre deux continents, euh, entre l'Europe et les États-Unis, le vieux, le, celui qu'on appelle nouveau, euh, entre deux langues, et puis entre tout simplement les mots. Euh, et c'est ce qu'on a vu un peu quand on a travaillé avec une, une certaine langue de euh, La position que, euh, qui est celle de Rosemary Waldrop, euh, euh, et, et la notion de position, pardon, est au cœur euh, de son travail, un travail. Euh, on va peur des mots, immense, euh, euh, travail de traductrice, euh, peut-être tout d'abord, elle traduit euh, un autre poète immense, Edmond Jabès, euh, peut-être euh, elle pourra nous en dire euh, quelques mots euh, plus tard, elle traduit aussi euh, depuis l'allemand, donc de l'allemand vers l'anglais, euh, avec Oscar Pastior, euh, ou euh, encore, je vais encore te demander de prononcer son nom, <rire> voilà, euh, avec un poème par exemple comme ça, donc à traduire, vous imaginez pour vous, euh, étudiants euh, traducteurs, euh, ce que ça peut donner, ou des poèmes comme ça. Euh, voilà, donc euh, avec la double difficulté de la forme et euh, de, de, du passage de l'allemand vers euh, l'anglais. Travail d'éditeur aussi avec son mari, euh, le poète euh, américain Keith Waldrop. Ils ont créé la maison d'édition Burning Deck. J'ai apporté quelques livres de Burning Deck, Barbara Guest, euh, ici. Je sais que certains euh, ne seront pas euh, euh, ils seront plutôt touchés par, euh, par la référence à Barbara, Barbara Guest. Bon, j'ai apporté qu'un livre. Euh, et puis euh, aussi une anthologie, alors ça c'est assez amusant, A Book of the Best ba Bad Verse. « A book of the best bad verse » qui a eu, je crois, beaucoup, beaucoup de succès. Donc, euh, donc voilà. Euh, donc, du meilleur, et, euh, du meilleur dans le pire. <rire> Alors, travail de traductrice, travail d'éditeur, travail de poète et de création singulière. Rosemary Wardrop, de par sa situation, un peu comme ça, à cheval, entre deux, euh, cette hésitation entre les langues, fait travailler la langue. Elle pense la langue en même temps qu'elle l'écrit, et ça c'est vraiment quelque chose, quelque chose qui, est, qui est important de, 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 de comprendre, c'est cette notion du processus qui est au cœur de, de son écriture. Euh, on pourrait dire, on en a parlé aujourd'hui avec les L3, on pourrait dire qu'elle parle de, du rien, mais on en a parlé hier soir, on en a parlé aussi, de emptiness, euh, 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 et puis à partir de ce rien, euh, et à partir de, de processus de, de, qui implique le collage, elle euh, a une écriture du présent, 
euh, une écriture du présent et on pourra notamment lire la fin, la toute fin de A King to the Language of America euh, pour comprendre euh, que finalement, euh, euh, il n'y bon, a aucun moyen de, 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 de regarder en arrière, hein, aucun moyen de regarder le futur, mais finalement l'écriture se fait euh, dans le présent par une écriture de la contiguïté ce que Fiona McMahon appelle une, po une poétique de la contiguïté dans, dans un article, ce que Rosemary Woodrop appelle, j'emprunte ça au, à un titre d'un des poèmes de Splitting Image, euh, ce qu'elle appelle « surface tensions », donc des tensions de surface. Euh, effectivement, la surface, c'est vraiment important pour, le, pour, le, pour, le texte, euh, pour les textes que crée euh, Rosemary Woodrop, euh, et on pourrait dire que là se situe un tournant peut-être dans l'écriture, un tournant dans la, dans la poésie, euh, tournant négocié également par euh, peut-être euh, John Cage, également par euh, des poètes français tels que, Emmanuel, euh, tels que Claude royer Journou ou Anne-Marie Albiac. Euh, ce tournant, ce serait non plus d'écrire sur le monde, mais euh, d'écrire le monde, le monde en train de se faire, le monde en train de se dire au moment où je le dis. Euh, et donc en cela d'échapper peut-être, ou de tenter d'échapper, mais ça on pourra en discuter euh, de tenter d'échapper à euh, la chose qui est très importante dans la poésie occidentale, c'est l'analogie donc de tenter d'échapper à, à un mode poétique qui, est, qui serait l'analogie pour euh, euh, retrouver une écriture de, de surface donc on a tenté comme ça un survol très trop rapide de la poésie américaine pour justement arriver euh, au travail de Rosemary Woodrop. <rire> euh, 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 voilà, c'est Crash Course. Euh, euh, et notamment à travers ce livre qui est A King to the Language of America et sur lequel on a passé peut-être trois, quatre séances. Et c'est vous qui allez poser des, des questions. Euh, sur le travail de Rosemary, sur son origine, on commencera peut-être par là d'ailleurs, euh, euh, puisque ça a émergé ce matin. Je voudrais dire encore une fois que c'est une immense chance de, de pouvoir parler avec Rosemary ce soir, et euh, je tiens, après avoir vous avoir remercié tous d'être venus, à lui dire tout le plaisir que nous avons à l'entendre et à poursuivre ce lien transatlantique que elle Kif et d'autres poètes et des poètes français, Emmanuel Ocar, Claude Royer Journou, Anne Marie. Juliette Valéry ont contribué à rendre si intense et je pense que encore une fois on va entendre euh, cela ce soir. Merci Rosemary. Merci Vincent. <rires> Thank you all for being here. Uh, Vincent suggested that I talk a little bit about how I came to write this book, uh, which has a rather strange form, as some of you know, but others maybe not. Um, As he said, I'm an immigrant into the United States, and I live in Rhode Island. And at some point, I thought I should really find out a bit about uh, the people who were there before the English and the white man. The tribe of American Indians that lived in this territory is called the Narragansett. And so I was looking around in the, in the library what there was about the Narragansett Indians, and I found a book with the title, A Key into the Language of America by Roger Williams, uh, published in 1643. And so I took this book home, and, uh, and I found it was much more interesting than I had at first thought. Uh, Roger Williams was an, uh, an, a Puritan uh, preacher from Massachusetts who uh, went to, uh, to Rhode Island to the Narragansett Indians. Oh. Anyway, he went and learned the language of the Narragansett Indians in order to convert them to Christianity. Uh, but as he uh, and so his book started as a phrase book, uh, you know, a useful thing, you know, like "Good morning is asko vekwasunumis," which would also be useful to the traders, you know, that were buying furs from the Indians, etc. But he very quickly uh, added paragraphs about Indian customs. And this is very interesting because he recognized a culture when nobody else did, when everybody else considered them as savages. He realized that there were patterns, that there was, you know, that there was a culture. It's the first uh, 
a sympathetic presentation of Indian custom, Indian customs that I've come across. And, and then the third thing that he did was um, it, each of his chapters ended with a little moralizing poem, which in fact said, how come that these Indians who do not have the grace of God like we Christians do, how come they behave better than we do? <laughs> you know? um, but um, uh, this book, uh, and anyway, his attitude toward the Indian got him into trouble very quickly because uh, in recognizing the, uh, that there was a culture there, he began to question the right of the English to the land they had simply occupied. And he published a treatise that was immediately confiscated and burned. Uh, uh, the authorities of Massachusetts tried to deport him to, uh, back to England. Um, and, but he was warned and escaped to Rhode Island and sort of took refuge with the Indians with whom he had stayed before. Um, anyway, um, I found this book fascinating and decided to use it and really cannibalize it, you know. I used the structure, I used his chapter titles, and I used the, the, uh, the structure of uh, word list, prose paragraph, and poem. Um, but uh, say my prose paragraphs are more about the clash of cultures, you know, like an old in, and the old Indian culture, but then the whole Western culture that I have sort of in my head and my subconscious, not just from the time of Roger Williams. And um, also I felt uh, what was missing for me was uh, the voice of a woman in all this. Uh, so I added uh, another prose paragraph in italics that has uh, it has a woman's voice talking about being in between, you know, uh, b between the natives and the, the conquerors and the conquered, between men and women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, and for my word list, uh, I simply played with the chapter titles. You know, f uh, for one, t for instance, in the chapter five that deals with. Uh, consanguinity, as he says, uh, blood relations, family relations. I used a lot of words that have to do with blood, like uh, curdling, letting, pressure, thirsty. You know, like blood curdling, blood letting, <laughs> blood pressure, blood thirsty, and, and things like that. Or I played with a sound uh, like fishing gets into fissile and fission, atomic fission, etc. So, um, I play, and my poems play with the whole area of that. But I think uh, this is really all, well, you could say this book is sort of my immigrant's perspective on the, the history of my adoptive country. You know? um, and uh, I would like to read you uh, one or two chapters to start with, and then we'll get, get to the questions. Okay, chapter one, salutations are of two sorts and come immediately before the body. The pronunciation varies according to the point where the tongue makes contact with pumice found in great quantity. This lends credence, but no hand. Not so entirely Narragansett the roof of the mouth. Position of hand or weapon conventional or volcanic formation. Asko vikvasunumis, good morrow. Sing, salubrious, imitation, intimate. I was born in a town on the other side which didn't want me in so many. All streets were long and led. In the center, a single person had no house or friends to allay excessive sorrow. I, like other girls, forgot my name in the noise of traffic, opening my arms more to measure their extension than to offer embrace. The courteous pagan, barefoot, and yes, his name laid down as dead. One openness 
one woman door, so slow in other ways, so close. And chapter four of their numbers. Without the help of Wall Street, how quick they are in casting up inalienable numbers. We do not have them. With help of hybrid corn instead of Europe's pens or poisons, edge of ingenuity between numb and nimble forest of rigid wave before it crashes. Let it be considered whether a split providence or separate insistments in their own minds have taught them, or concentration, its circular surface, what's called arithmetike, a riddle on which matter rests. Posak of the masculine gender. Posak, one of the feminine gender. Posak, with time to dawdle, to cultivate lucidity and metric structure, yet did not play by numbers. Too many messengers that do not speak. A bowel movement every day and one war every generation. I feared becoming an object too boring for my bones to hold up, however clumsily. Nostalgia figured in bruised shins and loss, loss of eternity in triplicate, such that my knees could come apart and tell their seeds. Okay, questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but both those books are much more literary. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going on to the Indians, you know, who did not have a literature, that did not have a, a written language even uh, before Roger William came and spelled it out. And uh, by the way, there's a curious thing is that now the uh, the present Narragansetts in, uh, in Rhode Island, they turn to Roger William's book as their kind of Bible. Uh, I, I went to a talk by the present medicine woman of the tribe, and uh, and I was very astonished because I recognized most of the words of Narragansett that she used because they were all in Roger Williams, you know. So it becomes their dictionary, and this this really, in a way, is very disturbing because it really shows that the language basically died, and. It, you know, and that they're making now an effort to revive it, to hold on to the few words of Narragansett that they know that they have come back, come down to them through the white intermediary. It's very, very disturbing. But the whole tribe was actually, you know, decimated in the in the in the 18th century and either sold into slavery or became uh, indentured servants and uh, and the whole culture you know, basically got lost. And now they're sort of trying to revive it. But, uh, but so, you know, like, uh, uh, I, I share uh, Susan Howe's love for Emily Dickinson. You know, I, I've, never, I've never cottoned onto, <laughs> uh, onto Walt Whitman, but it was always Emily Dickinson that I loved. And, uh, but, uh, and also, uh, you know, In the American Grain is about, book, is about literary books. Yes. Whereas this goes back a bit farther. I mean, of course, the book is also a literary book, uh, you know, Roger Williams' book, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's sort of trying to go a, a step beyond, you know. In Susan Howe, it's actually more in the poems uh, where she goes into the captivity narratives, you know, of, uh, especially of women that had been captured by the Indians and then lived with the Indians. She draws largely on on such narratives that were written down and, and makes wonderful poems out of them. You know. 
But yes, so there, there is this interest in digging down into the history of the place, which especially since, I mean, the United States is so little oriented toward the past. It's, you know, it, there's lip service paid to the Constitution all the time, but otherwise, you know, they, they only look at the moment and, and the next moment, not very far into the future either, it seems to me, but just till the next election, you know. <laughs> you know so, so um, but it's interesting to try to go back. And as I, as I told in the little preface to it, it was the place names that first, uh, that were my first encounter with the Narragansett language. It's there in the place name. They're, they're very strange uh, with all of those cues in it and things, you know, like uh, Quonset and Usque uh, Park, Matunuk, Mushantik, Namquit, Popasquash, Sokatucket, you know. Uh, so that, that was sort of the first thing that I encountered that was still there that indicated the presence of the Narragansett. And of course, there, there is a reservation in Rhode Island, and there, are, there is a big cemetery and that sort of thing. But, uh, I was wondering if you were influenced by German poetry at all when you were growing up. Pardon? I was wondering if you were influenced by German poetry when you were growing up. Uh, of course, I'm in, influenced by German poetry. How could I have avoided it? <laughs> you know, I grew up there. Uh, Who are some of your favorite poets? Uh, well, especially you know, I I was always in love with Rilke, and you know, and of course, I was force-fed Goethe in school. You know, <laughs> but uh, but he's also a very great poet. Uh, but it took me a long time to really appreciate him because. You know, that's how one is when one has been forced to read somebody. You know. But uh, yes, and then uh, I also, uh, Gottfried Benn is a very great poet, uh, and Tzilan, of course, you know, whom you know well because he lived in Paris uh, most of his life, uh, his later life. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I, I couldn't possibly help being influenced by them. Um, you know, how far or so, I can't tell. Other people can maybe tell. But, uh, and I try to keep up with it. I try to read German, uh, you know, and uh, sort of I manage to come to Europe maybe every three years or so, and I, when I go to Germany, I, you know, I, I, I rifle the bookstores for, you know, for what there is on new poetry and, What's your relationship with poetry? Ah, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> you know? Well, uh, you know, on the surface, uh, I read it, I write it, I translate it, I publish it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. But... Uh, but I know that won't satisfy you. <laughs> you know, I know you, you meant it a bit more... As a child or as a teenager, did you read poetry or...? Pardon? Were you interested? I was, yes, uh, I was, I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't, you know. And in fact, uh, sort of one thing I remember of my childhood was uh, that my father would, uh, would recite Heine poems to me. Yeah, and, uh, and I still remember the, <laughs> those. Uh, so, you know, that was part of my childhood and obviously a part I loved. And, and there was also another thing which I hadn't thought about until recently, and that is um, my mother and I have a difficult relationship, but, uh, but I remember that sometimes as a child, you know, I was suddenly bored and I would ask her, you know, what shall I do? Yeah. And uh, in German that would be, was soll ich machen? And she would answer, uh, dance and sing. No, uh, dance and laugh. And in German that is tanzen und lachen. So was soll ich machen? Tanzen und lachen. So, and of course I was furious, you know, because, you know, I wanted a concrete suggestion of something to do. But, you know, late, I, again it stuck in my head and later I realized she gave me a rhyme. She gave me something, you know, that later I knew how, you know, take her up on. 
So, uh, so I think poetry goes goes back uh, with me, you know, to childhood, and uh, and then it was also like um, when I met my husband, uh, which was in Germany. He was in the in the U.S. Army, stationed in Germany, um, and uh, he was sort of trying to take me to to things, to movies, and so and. And uh, it really didn't quite click until he suggested we translate together some German poems <laughs> into into English. And once we s sat down together and started doing that, <laughs> things started flying. You know? <laughs> you know? So it's been a long time. But you know, it's really true. Um, it is sort of my life. And uh, you know, there are periods when I don't write. Uh, but then I usually translate or at least read. But also when I don't write uh, poems for a long time, I get very unhappy and, and hard to live with. You know? <laughs> I get very crotchety. Uh, so um, I guess it's my life is what I would say. When you're writing, do you think about how it sounds when you, when you say it or how you, how you look at it or the imagery that comes about? How do you decide? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mostly start with some phrase that uh, that I usually take from somebody else, you know, some somewhere else, and uh, and then I often simply follow sound lines. Some of the words in that sentence lead me to other words. And uh, and I just sort of start thinking about those words and the words in the line that I start out with. And uh, I used to uh, sort of strew these words around on a page, sort of scatter them. And then eventually there would be sort of little arrows from one word to another and it would become a sentence or something or, or a line or a little phrase. Uh, but now that has changed because now I write directly on the computer. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually, it has become more linear because, uh, you know, it's hard on the computer to put one word here and one down there, you know. So now I start out with uh, sort of just like throwing phrases and words onto the screen and then seeing how they interact and if something comes out of it. And then maybe looking at another book and taking another couple words and see if they spark something. Yeah. Um, I feel like you that you are using something or adding something when you are translating your poetry into French or into another language. When I'm translating, am I adding things? Yeah, or losing things? Always losing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely losing. <laughs> no question. <laughs> And no, I try not to add. I think that's a very bad idea, you know. But uh, but I try to make it an English po a poem in English. You know, for instance, when I translate from French, I try first to understand the text very well, and I first make a very word for word version, which of course turns out as nonsense in English. You know, it just doesn't work. And, uh, and then I try for a while not to look at the original and just work on this sort of nonsense word by word version as if it were my first draft of something. And I try to change it and make it a, a poem in English, a text in English that works in English. And then I put it aside. And then the third stage is I look at it again with the original and see if I've gotten too far away and try to wrestle it back to, to the French. You know. For instance, in this uh, Edmond Jabez, of whom I've translated a lot, um, one thing was he has very, very long sentences. And in my second stage, I cut up these sentences drastically to be a little closer to the you know to the short american sentences and then in the third stage i really decided that was a bad idea and i really tried to make them long again so they would have the kind of breath that edmond jabez has in french 
So as much as possible, you know, I try to get back to this long, drawn-out syntax. But uh, no, I try not to add. I mean, one probably does, you know, unconsciously we always add ourselves into whatever we do. But, uh, but as far as I can control it, I <laughs> eliminate what I maybe have added. In one of your texts, you say that uh, you refer to, you quote actually, and Andrea Lucas saying that to translators to gain ground uh, on, um, on a language and, and doing something that language wouldn't do otherwise. Right. Um, so can, can, can you say more? Well, you know, you don't add to the actual work you are translating, but you add something to the language you are translating into. Because you you know just a good translation sort of stretches the target language, yeah. It uh, and that it would be this gaining ground, making new territory, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, are you influenced by by your German roots, or is it um, a real American country? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, of course I'm influenced by my German roots, you know. I mean, we don't get rid of these things. <laughs> but So it's maybe, maybe it's not real American poetry. <laughs> but I, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, it, I write what I write. But, uh, well, but it's in English, <laughs> you know. And Americans read it and... Don't, if they don't know my biography, they don't know <laughs> that they're German roots. You know. do, do you consider yourself as a real American today? Or, uh, I'm, not, what I'm what no real anything. Real <laughs> you know? I, you know, I speak English with a slight German accent. Mm -hmm. I now speak German with a slight American accent. <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, so I'm between. I'm nothing real. <laughs> I'm not a real American, but I'm not a real German. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a real uh, European even anymore because, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of caught in mid-Atlantic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'm a, an amphibian. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it's curious that you said this, am I influenced by German roots? Uh, for a long time, I very consciously tried to avoid anything that might come from Germany. You know, I was trying very much to be an American writer. And, uh, and then one day I saw a book by a young American woman, a book of poems, that used a lot of compound words like German does. You know, like German has, you know, where you say, uh, quelque chose, de quelque chose. The Germans just put it right, the two nouns just together, right next to each other. And um, uh, um, English doesn't do that either. And there was this book of poems that constantly worked with this putting two nouns clashing, you know, together. And I thought, wow, she dares do something I haven't dared do in my work. And why don't I dare? You know, why can't I do this also? And I don't use it much, but it, it gave me a little bit of a freedom toward my heritage, saying, well, there may be poems in which it will work to put nouns together like that, even so that is not normal English practice. So I got a little less afraid of, of my heritage, you know. Yeah. Yes? Are you still happy with this version of the book, or if you would change or add anything to it? No. No, you know, once a book is printed, I think it's like, you know, I've given birth to it, it's out there, <laughs> it's no longer mine. And then it's, you know, and there are maybe some some moments, actually there is a little rhythmic moment in the last poem that I, I'm not altogether happy with, <laughs> you know, but it's done, you know. I, I don't want to go back and, and do anything to it. Uh, after the reproduction of profiles was done, I had the feeling that there, there were themes in it that needed to be developed farther, uh, like the, the the resonance of an empty of emptiness, and uh, like uh, the, the, res, 
the air column, the empty air in a flute, you know, that resonates, uh, the, the empty womb in the woman, uh, and that these are, uh, and then I, of course I played with uh, the su supposedly empty space between two opposites, you know, the le tierce exclu, uh, the, law, the law of excluded middle, and but I found that all these emptinesses are actually very fruitful, which is why I uh, gave the second book the title uh, Lawn of the Excluded Middle. So English allows me a nice pun here, you know, from law, loi, to lawn, pelouse, you know. So I, f I found the law of the excluded middle uh, led me to uh, a, a fruitful place of emptiness. Uh, uh, but so there it was, it was direct, and it, that, that book came directly out of the reproduction of profiles. It was a continuation. And the third part of the trilogy uh, also did, except uh, there were some slight formal changes that I made. You know, rather than having an I and a you, I changed to a, a he and a she, sort of taking a peu de recul. If you could talk about how you see language as a key, and um, in looking at the text as a series of um, layers or forms or structures, um, if you could talk about lexicon um, approaches to understanding and reading, because you said things like um, the Narragansett language is a dead language, and the text I'm working from, I was working from, Roger Williams' text was a political or moral treatise in a way. So, um, rather than asking you to analyze your text, I'm really interested, poetically speaking, how you are going about making this text, which is so much about poetry as a key, at least. To right, later. right. I'm not sure I can answer that because. Uh, you know, when I work, uh, it's intuitively, and I don't have a program. Uh, I mean, I have a, I had the program to use Will Williams's text, but I was also using many other things, and I sort of allowed anything. As I said, you know, I allowed sort of my whole culture to maybe enter, you know, even 20th century things, you know, like radioactivity gets in and things. I'm not trying to write a historical thing, and I'm not trying to write only from Roger Williams, but also from my position. But, uh, you know, how in, in detail, how it happens, I'm, I don't think I can tell. Because, uh, you know, I try, I put words down, and uh, sometimes something clicks, you know, and, uh, and, then, and then it works. But... Um, and at the, at the same time, of course, I think of poetry as a method of questioning. You know, and, and this probably comes out of my, uh, largely out of my work with Edmond Jabez, who, you know, whose main work is called The Book of Questions, and who thought of also of poetry as a questioning, you know, rather than an expression of something that you feel, uh, a questioning. And... Uh, so I, you know, I think of uh, I, I was questioning Roger Williams's text. I was trying to question my position and my culture in relation to this past that I have a document of here. Uh, but how it happens, you know, it, it, I'm I, I'm afraid I really can't tell. Can you yeah. talk about the different parts? Um, just on the page, there's four parts. Uh huh. Well, see, three three parts are are stolen from Roger Williams. You know? uh, I mean, he, in his book, uh, it's a prose paragraph, word list, another prose paragraph, a long word list. You know, whereas I just took one prose paragraph, one word list, and then my woman's voice, and the poem at the end. Uh, but but so the idea of having prose and verse, uh, prose and verse and word lists. Uh, is simply taken over from Williams. Uh, so that was a given, you know, except for that second prose paragraph that is a little bit n more narrative than the others, uh, uh, but which I sort of thought went with this whole thing. Uh, 
The feminine voice, uh, we were wond wondering this morning if um, the I is used with no water. No. <laughs> because uh, in the introduction you say that you, you were born on the other side mm -hmm. and you begin um, the, the Italian parts, uh, parts with, um, in the chapter one, chapter with, um, yes. I was born uh, in, on the other side. So. Well, yes, so far <laughs> it is true, <laughs> but it's not, no, it's not autobiographical, but, uh, but it is the same kind of situation, yeah, and, uh, and it's also the same kind of position. I think I, I have some variant, one, I thought I was one of the conquering men, you know, that, that were wandering across the country, taking it over, uh, so it is sort of my position. <laughs> but it's not uh, biographical details. <laughs> no. Also, you know, like uh, sort of negative things about my family are also correct, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. In the last poem of the, of, the, of the first chapter, the courteous pig and barefoot and yes, his name lay down as dead. One openness, one woman door, so slow in otherwise so close. We saw all these O's uh, everywhere. In the, uh, in, the, in the poem, and the poem being, being about one woman door, but the, the, the poem also being about uh, emptiness. Um, um, and so, you know, so he said, all right, so, so uh, does, she, does she intend these typographical puns, or, 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 um, um, or is it just not by mere chance? <laughs> <laughs> and, and would you actually leave the reader uh, an entire um, sort of freedom to say whatever he has to say. That was the, that was the question. That well, of course. I mean, the, once the book is out, it belongs to the reader, you know. But, uh, well, it's not chance. Uh, it's sound association, you know. But it's not, I did not sit down and saying, well, now I want, I didn't start out saying, well, I'll have first words with I, and then I'll have words with O. You know, I, I started out with, uh, uh, well, actually, the the O's sort of came out of the you know good morrow and then sorrow. So the O's uh, were prepared in the earlier, and then they come in the poem. They come a lot again, you know. But I think they were brought in by good morrow and sorrow, yeah. Uh, and the sing uh, good morrow um, salutation. So I started out with S's salutation, sing, salubrious. And I don't quite remember how I got to to the next step, to imitation. But once I had imitation, well, maybe because I was imitating Roger Williams. Uh, and then the intimate again came up by sound association. Yeah. So it's not chance, but it's letting myself go with the sound of the words, uh, sometimes more than with their sense. Yeah. And that's how perhaps Jacques uh, Rougeau, who you, you like and who translated you, etc. He says, uh, he says, la poésie ne pense pas. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it, uh, I think he's wrong. <laughs> you know? I think poetry does think, but also poetry listens. You know, so it's not just thinking language, but listening to language, and I think that is very important. And uh, again, I want I want to bring up Edmond Jabez for this. Uh, he has a wonderful passage about how the poet is really only a catalyst, that the words do it all among themselves. And so, what he ha uh, he has this image of the poet sits. Uh, the poet prepares a little park, uh, into which where the words come uh, as lovers. And they, you know, they meet in this park, they have sex, you know, and then go off together. You know. and, uh, and the poet is only the one who prepares the page, the park, the place where words can do their thing. And I think that is, uh, that is very profound, really. Uh, I mean, a profound analysis, a profound simile, say, for, for poetry that you make it possible for the words to connect. And they have their own vectors. They, they will find each other. And if they do find each other, then the poem will work. Yeah. Uh, even so, uh, you don't, 
you can't quite explain why it works, but uh, it's that you know that the birds are right with each other. That the birds become lovers and go off together. You know, I I, I really love this image. You know. and how about writing novels and 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 uh, also narratives? Because there's, there's there's a bit of narrative, of course, in the in the, uh, in, the, in, the in the whole book. Um, but so so how how does this question of uh, words finding each other uh, uh, is this still relevant in the novel? You also wrote uh, a novel. I think it's still relevant, but less so because there are all these other factors that come in a novel. You know, in a novel, once you have a plot, you have to work it out. You know, so uh, the, there are all these other co considerations. Whereas poetry really is primarily listening to words. Yeah, so. It, it works mostly for poetry. And, uh, you know, and even what little narrative I have is, is secondary. Yeah, uh, it, I did not start out with the narrative, you know, but I thought, well, I'll take a young woman's voice and sort of in my position. Uh, and so it got a little narrative, but, uh, but that was not really what I was thinking about. You know, I was just thinking of getting that voice there. Uh, you're saying how it's the words that are doing the work, uh -huh. um, and we are just seeing them in the park. But do you not think that it depends on the reader, on how we interpret the words, and that what we've read influences us, and how we think, and how we connect things? So what one person might read might be different from what the other person reads. That is true, up to a point. Of course you bring all your own experiences to your reading, but, but it is limited. I mean, it's limited by what's on the page. So the words that are on the page are determining what you're reading, even so you also bring your own experiences to it. So, you know, there's a, a limit to how, how you know, well, if you go off completely into your own daydreaming, you're no longer reading. You know? So, uh, you know, there is a... But yes, you bring your, you bring yourself to the, to the reading. But you... But you need to interact with the words on the page, you know, the way uh, the writer interacts, you know. I once, uh, yeah, I, I, I once sort of uh, made a kind of diagram of, I, I think of it as, uh, you know, there is, uh, say, this is the author, and there is this huge thing that is language, and of course it's not right, the author is really inside, you know. But uh, interacting with language, say, writing, you set off vibrations. Yeah. And, uh, but then you concentrate these down to a little thing, which is the poem. And then the reader comes, and he, the same thing happens. As you read, you set off vibrations, you know, that your experience and your relation to language interacts with that little thing there, which is the poem. And so on both sides, there is a huge vibration, but you know, it sort of has its kernel in that poem there. And, you know, I mean, like, like all diagrams or like analogies, it limps, <laughs> you know, it's inadequate. But it's, you know, there's something of that kind of thing going on, I think. Yes. Do you want to, in a way, to go beyond uh, language and words and to go further and to try to find something else in words? I don't know how to explain, but to find another, um, another um, significance in words than um, sort of, I don't know, society or uh, <laughs> ex all external things as just put it in a sort of conformity. Well, uh, you know, my feeling about language is the only religious feeling I have. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, I don't have any feeling for God or the infinite other than the infinite of language. I, th I think language is uh, such a huge thing. 
And I mean, the marvelous thing is we've invented, I mean, mankind has invented language, and at the same time, language surpasses us. You know, language is enormous. It's an, it, it is an infinite, and its combinations are infinite. Its history is so rich. I mean, entire, you know, countries, nations are contained within, within it. Uh, our lives are contained within it. Um, so I have this, you know, so I don't want to go beyond language because I think it's, you know, it is huge. And it is what makes us humans, you know. It's what distinguishes us from the animals, though they, some say the, the monkeys are catching up, you know. <laughs> so uh, still, you know, we define ourselves through language. So, um, but there is one thing I do want to get at in the poems, and that is silence. And I think, uh, I think this is also part of the essence of poems, is that they don't, like prose, go to the end of the, of the page. They don't fill up all the sp available space, but they stop before and allow emptiness, silence, uh, its part. So poetry, in a way, admits that uh, you know the noise we make is not everything <laughs> you know that there is silence and and basically death i mean it's always an acknowledgement of death you know and poetry does that all the time it acknowledges death silence the void the emptiness and uh and that is a little scary <laughs> you know but uh i think that is of the essence of poems and of course, I have a problem now because I'm mostly writing prose poems. <laughs> so I've given up on this little piece of silence at the end of the line. And I, I sort of have to work at getting some of that silence inside my sentences uh, to still acknowledge death and the, and the nothingness. Yeah. But so that's what I would say is the sort of transcendent uh, dimension of poetry. And when we read uh, Roger Williams, A Key to, a key to the Language of America, we can see that uh, the language um, he used is very plain, very easy to understand, and in the way you, you write or borrow his words, it looks more ancient, uh, it looks older, and is it part of your process of reappropriation and or reinventing language? Well, you know, on, on the simplest level, this is simply how he spelled it. So it was sort of acknowledging this is not this is a quote from Roger Williams without putting quotation marks. I thought I'd put it in in uh, in um, fat letters, <laughs> yeah. So that is the simplest level. But the others, I think you put your finger on something uh, that also, you know, I was aware of and that actually pleased me, that it's a certain alienation effect, you know, it makes them look strange. And thereby, uh, as you read it, it, it sort of stops the reader a little bit, you know. So you don't just read across it, just for the meaning, but you are sort of stopped by the strange spelling, and therefore think a little bit more about it and wonder a bit about it. And of course, that is another aim of poetry, you know, to make us stop, you know, to make things seem strange and uh, you know and wonder about them. So, so it's you know, on the one hand, it's simply taken that way from Williams, but but I was very happy with that effect of strangeness the spelling. Yeah. I wanted to know because um, in chapter 13 uh, of businesses there are three S's. <laughs> 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 <It's so good. laughs> I think that is simply a coquille. <laughs> <laughs> No, that is a typo. <laughs> that also happens. You know? <laughs> but it but it enters into this whole thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. 
<laughs> There's no deeper meaning <laughs> to that. <laughs> Do you want me to read some more from the key, or should I go to the new ones? Uh, yeah, perhaps you could read some... The chapter of business, could you read it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, which, one, which number is that again? <laughs> uh, can you find it? <laughs> All right, chapter six yeah. of the of the family and business of the house. That's the okay, yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay, of the family and business of the house. A solemn word, family, that no one trained to to ex sorry, a solemn word, family, that no one trained to explore celestial mobilities would try to hinder not even a stranger, above genus and below order, covered with chestnut bark. They stow their families along diagonal axes and put their eggs in baskets, pigs in pokes. Prefer the movement of planets or buffalo to European coatmen, identifiable strains to city planning, even when applied to lexical items. Vetuo mimese, a little house, which women live apart in the time of their exhaustive volume of the roundest. The aperture secured so no eruptions may crash out of proportion or long poles on the offside of finance, which commonly the men erect, long neck and body, a longer house for the last stand. The other and its head Sleep has no of mirth, the fall. A procession, a river of people, the whole town crossed into exultation to subject the body to their rites of candle and flame, cries and bewailing, morning and evening. Could I withdraw from such offering? I was not innocent enough to, to expect an end to hostility and housemaid's knee, a faulty birth, no guarantee of entrance. Nature the more ruthless in getting back its chemicals. I rushed my headlong into it and found I made no splash. It would take a different kind of water to quench my long terror. No one comes ignorant among corners and stones, carrying beans and a tune and child besides. A stranger's tongue, they must yet do not know, will twist their lullaby, their child, their hand-me-down, their gums, their jeans, their lovingly. That word list, by the way, is all book titles. Uh, the Other House by uh, Henry James, uh, A House and Its Head, <laughs> uh, is, um, what's her name, a British novelist. It'll come to me. Sleep Has No House by Anna Cavan, House of Mirth, Henry, you know, Hades Warden, and The Fall. I was thinking of the House of Usher of Poe, but, you know, Usher didn't get in. You know. so, yeah. uh, but since we talked about men and women, I would like to read the chapter 23 of marriage. I'm sort of fond of that. You know. So, of marriage. Flesh, considered as cognitive region as opposed to undifferentiated warmth, is called woman or wife. The number not stinted, yet the Narragansett generally have but one. While diminutives are coined with reckless freedom, the deep structure of the marriage bed is universally esteemed, even in translation. If the woman be false to bedlock, the offended husband will be solemnly avenged, arid and eroded. He may remove her clothes at any angle between horizontal planes. Mar, marrow, 
mutual convenience settlement. My lover was ready to overcome all manner of difficulty, but baffled by my claims to equality and clean towels. Even with the night between us, neither side would give up its position and prerogatives. We waited for a change of weather to reopen hostilities. Harmony pre-stabilized is turning on its axe to grind, to haul, to bind, to fold. The speed can't be sustained, even in constant rotation through periods of waxing and weaning. And maybe I'll read the last one. Of death and burial. He that has death in his house blackens his face, soot clotted with tears and gaping with vowels. They abhor to mention the dead by the name sealed into their lips, the bleeding stump of their tongues. Such he maupan, he that was prince here, is wrapped in wailing, in flexion, in hands before the face, before the face in smaller and smaller particles. Perspective unsettled by chemical methods. They bury sideways the mat he died on, the dish he ate from, the empty regions of his body, and sometimes hang his shadow upon the next tree, which none will touch but suffer to rot. Occlude, occult, orthodox, haphazard, obsolete, irreparable. Solitude in heat. I resented my lover turning his back on me for other mournful realities. So each crossing of space casually implicates the flesh. Attraction increasing faster than distance diminishes. I found myself alone among the rubble of love. I had finally reached the center of the city. It was deserted, in ruins. As useless as my birth and as permanent as a site of murder. A hitch in time, then the world changed. Then there was no memory. Then life could not be understood forward or backward. Okay, that's that. Thank you. Uh, do you have enough, or, do you, uh, or shall I read uh, just a few of those new poems? Okay, they are quite different. <laughs> they are, uh, well, it's from a sequence called um, A Little Useless Geometry and Other Matters. <laughs> so it, it starts out with ge geom geometric things, point, line, cylinders, cubes, squares, that kind of thing. So I'll just read before. Point. Beginning or end? Visible to the eye, the microscope, the myopic? So much for definition applied in public. Coiled up and withdrawn within itself, nevertheless a stronghold of vectors. I'd say a point's not meant to start a sentence, but no one's immune to anger, greed, or, on the other hand, missiles solid in the sky. If a point of pain is reflected off a field of objects, the painting constructs a surface of implacable geometry. Sometimes, however, reaching to the bones. It doesn't have to be lift of wing tear and steep fall. Every step lands us in ambiguities how much more a hike across the city, beyond fatigue or tightening in the chest. It's then I think, therefore I am beside the point. And line. I dreamed of stroking a line, caressing its ambition as long as time itself. It flew off without a tangent to protest the direction from left to right. Because the sun was suddenly blocked, my ruler not long enough. 
We are supposed to know our way as if going somewhere, but not talk to ourselves. This brings us to the difficulties of existence and accepted theories, not to mention childbirth. What if, fluent in frustration, I want to fall silent or out of season with the leaves without leaving a track in the cloud chamber? Was the line an illusion of my finger or despair dashing straight at me en route from Washington to Baghdad? From figure to proposition. Oh, this starts with a thing that is on the American $1 bill, like a triangle with an eye in it uh, symbolizing God, you know, a Masonic symbol, I think. So from figure to proposition. If the eye of God is a triangle that allows him to see beyond lines of soldiers, then is atheism denying geometry? When you've stipulated that a cross is more than an obstructed vertical, much remains to be said about crosshairs. Words come tumbling out before I can pose them for the camera or polish the lens. Is it too late to explore local customs the way these costumes don't cling close? Or why the view is widespread that the soul is immortal? Anxiety, I must tell you, is the main artery from heart to head that no square can bypass. The equality of the square's sides ought to reassure, but actually upholds the social divisions, top, bottom, right, left. When it squares your circumstance, can you hold on to the gun in hand or the hand? Volume. What do you mean body bags under my eyes? Under cover of fog or flag, the boundaries have, a, have absconded along with the dimensions. Flattened, fearful, furious. What can I do but tie ribbons to the idea of body and its wholeness? Failing complete analysis of the cause heard in explosions. Anything, they say, is bearable as long as light pours down over the city. But if there is no sun, I can't find the nothing new under it, and nightmares explode in my face. The desires that used to make my blood race show symptoms of aging. Out of breath, a feeble urge still rushes into the night, the pavement gashed in the foreground, sparse light dashed on accidental shadows, snow fallen. What footprints can I have left being without substance. And the last one is cylinders. Vertiginous verticals. We don't count on them, so they are the fingers of the earth, but recognize them as Doric, Ionic, corn cob. Or was it corruption? Regardless of standing conditions such as the state of the light or the nervous system of the observer, we think they are solid stone, so without a crust of knowledge. Compare those other stalagmites rising to graze on clouds full of gasoline, oil, napalm. If we called them stalactites, would the world be upside down? Cut to the curve's inclination toward moisture, the cylinders slow descend underground to ground water. There, let's leave the well enough alone so it will quench our long thirst. Thank you. <rire> Mal répondu. <rire> enfin, mais c'était des, des questions difficiles. <rire> Pour admettre. Non, non, c'était vraiment très bien. Et, euh, et merci de nous avoir lu ces, ces, ces deux textes. Euh, on va peut-être donc passer au bout de la question. Et puis, s'il y a un texte de questions, je vous invite à, à les poser à Rodrigo. Et voilà. Merci. Merci.
Yeah. <laughs>